Good morning. Welcome to the worship of the Lord at Heritage Bible Church this morning. I'm glad to see everybody here because if it's not here, it's got to be somewhere else. You have to be in the house of the Lord on Sunday morning. Now, you don't have to be, but you really should be. <laughs> Let's open with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for directing us by your Holy Spirit to be here this morning, to worship you, to give you our worship, our adulation, our praise, our thanksgiving, and our love. Work through us this morning, Father. Let this worship service be something pleasing to you, something that you can use for your purposes and for the building up of our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and give thanks. Amen. This morning's opening song is one that will keep you on your toes. It's a medley of Southern gospel songs. It's only about two and a half minutes long, but it's gonna shift songs. So I wanna see how fast you can shift the songs. All the words will be on the screen. Are you ready to sing this morning? Let's stand and sing a Southern gospel in you, to rest in you in the midst of troubled times, that we don't have to fret, we don't have to worry, we need to be cautious, do the things that need to be done, but our confidence is in you, and nothing comes our way 
that doesn't come by you first and without a purpose. And Lord, I just thank you for each one who's here. I pray your blessing upon them. I pray your comfort, your strength, your joy, and your peace in their hearts. I do pray for Mrs. Jarvis that you would be with her. I also pray for Kathy who's having vertigo problems. And I'm sure there are others who are going through some difficulties and trying times, whether with health or other issues in their lives. And Lord, I pray your special care for them, your hand upon them, your encouragement for them, and where necessary and needed, your healing touch. And Lord, you know the needs of each one here this morning. And I'm sure there are some sitting here who have heavy burdens on their hearts of one sort or another. And I pray you would be their peace. That you would encourage them. I always love that passage in the Psalms, Lord, where it says you are the lifter up of our head. Lift up their head. Give them your strength in the midst of their weakness. And Paul boasted in that that he could have your strength in his weakness. May we experience that as well. I do pray for Jim as he preaches this morning that you would minister by the power of your spirit through him. And as Eula and Larry share with us, that you administer through them and continue to minister through Robert's ministry as well. May you be exalted and may we be blessed in you and drawn closer to your heart we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, John. Well, this morning we have a, a nice uh, surprise, for me anyway. Eula and Larry are going to bring us a message and song this morning, so listen to the words of this song. It's really great. We are Larry and Eula Bousman, traveling with Christ. Somebody said something. That you there? And this is my special request. In Luke 2, starting in verse 41, there's a story about Jesus when he was 12 years old. He and his family went with the villagers to Jerusalem for the yearly sacrifice and worship. And uh, it after their worship time, they headed home. Mary and Joseph got about a day's journey away from Jerusalem and couldn't find Jesus, so they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. It took three days for them to find him, and they found him in the temple talking with the uh, learned people that day. And this is someone's uh, thoughts on what uh, transpired, the conversation that went on, on my father's side. Just a young boy in the temple one day Talking with the doctors, they were so amazed Never had they seen one so young speak so sweet. They ask him many questions, conversation went like this. What do you mean, son? On my mother's side, my name is Jesus. But on my father's side, they call me Emmanuel. How old are you? On my mother's side, I'll be crucified, but on my father's side, in three days I will rise and sit at my father's side. If you believe you're going to be there, say amen. Oh, you can do better than that. 
And by the way, I can relate more to a child. I would see lunch, and I would eat it. The way we see ourselves, how we identify ourselves, will to a great degree influence how you view people, things, and all the circumstances around you. How you see yourself will determine how you see the world around you. Do you see yourself as short, tall, funny? Um, oops, uh, uh, funny, uh, um, um. I'm looking around trying to, <laughs> no, I shouldn't do that really. <laughs> I might say things like bald. Anyways, but <laughs> how about unwanted? Do you see yourself as your profession? A doctor, um, a store clerk, a beautician? Do you see yourself by your color? A black skin, a white skin, a Washington red skin? <laughs> I thought that was funny. <laughs> There's countless words, infinite number of words that people use to identify themselves. If right now I handed you a piece of paper and said, how do you identify yourself? No two would not only be the same, they probably wouldn't even be close. Not even close. And so the words that we use to identify ourselves greatly impact the way we view the world the people, the things, and the circumstances that are surrounding us right now. So, for instance, I happen to know there's someone here today that has a medical background. And I happen to know that this person views the coronavirus pandemic in a much more serious fashion than I do. Um, but as a weatherman, which I was, if a thunderstorm were to come over, I would probably view the potential of that thunderstorm to do harm in a much more serious manner than he would. You see what I'm getting at? How you identify yourself determines how you think about what's around you. So my goal today is this. I want to simplify the identities of all of us. And I would like to give us an identity, all the same identity, consisting of three words. And think about this. If we have the same identity, if we see ourselves in the same manner, wouldn't we have a greater unity about how we see the world and our vision and our purpose here? So, what I'd like to begin with is I would like everyone to strip. No. <laughs> My wife said, I want to look at John's face when you say that. <laughs> but actually, what I would like you to do is, using your imaginations, I want you to remove your flesh. I want you to take off your bodies, which we will say represents what we are in the world and in the world system. So, I'll give you a few minutes, use your imaginations, and just take your bodies off, throw them on the floor in front of you. Okay, everyone who's done that,
please raise your hand. Okay, you can't raise your hand because your body's on the floor in front of you. I just thought, I just thought I'd tell you. Now, what remains where you're seated is your spirit. That, that's what's left there. And since no one knows what their spirit looks like, or even if you can see your spirit, you're going to have to allow me to use my imagination as I look out at you, and I want to describe your spirit. I can tell you right now, I see two types. The first one I see is beautiful beyond imagination. It is illuminated by what I can only describe as living light. Living light. It emanates outward with a love that is so pure it cannot be of this earth. Wow. That's what I see. Whose spirit is it? The other spirit is cold. It's dark as ink. It is existing, but at the same time, it's lifeless. <coughs> Within it is a void so vast and empty. A place of deep longing, deep longing, of loneliness and despair. Two spirits, one alive and illuminated, one dead but still existing. The first spirit, because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the melding together of the Holy Spirit with our spirit, has been made one in unity with Christ. And the Bible says that in Christ there is life and the life is only light by which we are able to see. That life, the only light by which men can see. The second spirit is like the one we're born with. It's dead. It's dead not because it has ceased to exist, but because it's separated from God, who is the giver of life and light. It's dead. The Bible says, he who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son has not life. I don't want to spend a lot of time this morning talking about these dead spirits. Jesus alluded to them when he told a would-be disciple, let the dead bury the dead. He said of those trying to hide their dead spirits behind religion, you're like whitewashed tombs. You're pretty on the outside, but you're full of rotting, stinking, decaying garbage on the end. The Bible says the destination of these spirits is hell. And eternity and torment and anger. I have to give a little bit of good news here. By the way, behind me is a cross. Here's the good news. The good news is called the gospel, or the gospel is called good news. The cross is what Christ, the Son of God, carried through the streets of Jerusalem up a knoll overlooking a garbage dump and upon which he was crucified. Dying in my place, in your place, for my sins, 
and your sins. The cross is where the blood ran down. The blood of a sacrificial lamb that cleanses us, makes us white as snow and acceptable before God. That's the good news. If you're here this morning and you have a dead spirit, black and empty, in despair, there's loneliness and longing. It doesn't have to be that way. You can leave here with one of those beautiful, live, wonderfully filled with love spirits. You know, I, I never get tired of the gospel. I, I could hear it every Sunday. It always sounds sort of new to me. Okay, good news. Now, I said earlier that my goal was to simplify the identity question by offering three simple words that we all can use. Has anyone guessed what they are? Child of God. Huh? Child of God. Child of God, right. Mm -hmm. Are you going to go home and tell John, nah, 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 I got what you did. <laughs> Child of God. Bible says this, the Spirit Himself, the Holy Spirit Himself, testifies, bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. So, if you're a cop, if you're a seamstress drinking water, <laughs> <laughs> if you're a cop, right? Or whatever. Whatever, whatever. whatever. See, you get rid of all of that. Get rid of all that. Because first and foremost, you are. I am a child of God. And that identity should affect greatly the way we view people the way we view things and circumstances in our lives. How do I view it? As a child of God. And so, since this is about COVID-19 and racism and not about apples, you see, I, I have to tell you something. This woman over here, this Sue, She's voracious. I couldn't think of a title to this message. And I would get these texts and texts, what's your title, what's your title, what's your title? <laughs> I even made some up and she wouldn't use them, what's your title? Then it was like, if you can't think of one, I'll do one for you. <laughs> and, and I still can't. So maybe by the end of this message, you guys can give me a proper title. So, um, how should a child of God view COVID-19? Stay out of it. How should a child of God view COVID-19? Now, did you guys know that we've had this kind of pandemic dance before about 100 years ago? You've all heard that. 1918. If you read the history, you will be amazed at the similarities that's going on. In 1918, about 650,000 Americans died, about 50 million worldwide. Okay? In the United States, schools were closed, mass gatherings were done away with. People were quarantined. But you know what one of the biggest, if not the biggest problem was back then? What the people pushed back on? The wearing of masks. The wearing of masks. They had people shot and killed 
over arguments over the wearing of masks. Wednesday, on the news, a man, because of a confrontation over the mask, was shot and killed in Las Vegas. You cannot look at any news on TV, listen to it on it, without hearing the confrontation that are going on about masks. In 1918, the newspaper of a major city had this headline, open-faced sneezers will be arrested. So if you're an open-faced sneezer, watch out. Watch out. There's a store that has been held up since the pandemic began and the masks were required so many times that they have a sign on the door that if you're coming in here to shop, you have to come in with your hands up. <laughs> and that way they will know that you're not a criminal. Um, should that affect the child of God? How, how do you view this mask thing? And don't tell me. I really... <laughs> I really don't want to know. But here you go, right? The child of God. Let, let me give you some things. We're not to be afraid. Are you afraid with this pandemic going on? No. You know? I, I, to live is Christ, right? To die is gain. There's a verse somewhere in Thessalonians and it says, we're not destined for wrath, but that we might obtain salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who died for us, so that, right, awake or asleep, we might be with him. You know, that kind of takes the fear away. Awake or asleep, alive or dead, I'm going to be with Christ. Secondly, we're to pray for those affected and afflicted. How many are doing that? How many are praying for the businesses that are going under? So many, so many. Economic hardship. Not to mention the virus itself. And how many families has it affected? Are you praying as a child of God? I see, I'm, I'm looking around me. I need to pray. Do you pray for wisdom for our leaders? I think they need it. I think they need it. The Bible says we're to, hey, maybe you've heard this before. Love our neighbors. During a pandemic, there's a, not a better time to show love to your neighbor. We're never to endanger them by our actions. We're to look for opportunities to share the gospel. We're to maintain loving spirits. We're to follow the guidelines set forth by those who govern. And by the way, that's very difficult. If you live in Georgia, the governor is saying, hey, you don't got to wear masks and we're going to open everything. But if you live in Atlanta, Georgia, the mayor is saying, no, we're not. We're closing the bars and the gyms and you better wear a mask. So which leaders do you follow? It's difficult. It's difficult. We're not to test God by disregarding sound medical advice unless truly prompted by the Holy Spirit. No. Actually, as children of God, we shouldn't face this pandemic any differently than we face the trials of life. Really? Everything I just read pertains to if you go to the doctor and he says you have stage four. Or if you lose a child. All the trials of life, these things pertain. This should be no big shock. You know, guess what? 
God's in control. He's on his throne. There's a wonderful verse, and I just thought I'd bring it up because it comforts me. It gives me confidence that I'm living according to his word. And the reason it does is because I know how much of his word I haven't learned and how much more I don't understand. And so I say, how do I live by words that I haven't read yet and understand things that are beyond me? John 16 says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. So what does that mean? If you're not experiencing the leading of the Holy Spirit, there's probably one or two reasons. The first one, you're not listening. You're not listening. You know, I'm really good at not listening. God usually has to wrap me on the head. You know, listen. Four flat tires. Listen. You know, that's, that's, that's the one reason. The, the next reason is a little more serious. You don't have the leading of the Spirit because you don't have the Spirit. Maybe religion, a lot of that, maybe good works, but there's no real leading of the Spirit because you don't have the Spirit. Finally, I want to deal with racism. Not a very complex topic. <laughs> okay. Someone explain racism to me. No, it is. It's terribly complex. And I only have another hour and 30 minutes, but, I, <laughs> but I'm going to try. Uh, I'm going to try. The problem of hating our brothers, racism, I believe has always been with us. It's always been with the human race. And it's only going to be eradicated, done away with completely, from the human race when God's plan for mankind is complete. That's when you're going to see the end of racism. And that's bad news. It means that all the injustices, the riots, the genocides, they're going to continue to plague the human race, despite all human efforts. To the contrary, you might ask me, well, why do you believe that? And I thought about that, because that's what I asked myself, well, why do I believe that? And then I went back. I went back to the slave quarters in ancient Egypt. I went back to the Colosseum. You know, that's on the floor where the Christians were fed by the hundreds to the lions. And I went to the squalid decks of the slave ships. You know. And I went to Auschwitz and Ravensbrück, to the gas chambers and the ovens of Nazi Germany. And you see, all through time, it's existed. And I say, it's going to continue to exist. It's going to continue to exist. But where did racism come from? Here's a broad theological brush, people. So I hope you stay with me here. There's a verse that you would never think applies to racism. I've read it many times. But I've never seen it the way I saw it. A week or so ago. It's found in Matthew 5, verse 22. I'm just going to read the first sentence. 
But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Now those of you who know me know that I'm sort of a champion of the different Bible versions. I like to use them all because I get something different from each one. But in this particular case, I have to tell you, I don't understand how any translation can leave out the words without a cause because it changes the entire meaning of the verse. If it says simply anyone who's angry with his brother is in danger of the judgment, well, why? What if it's a righteous anger? What if I'm angry with my brother because he's beating up homeless people? You know, Jesus was angry with the people in the temple who were cheating the pilgrims. You know, he was angry in the temple when, when, when they refused to see that a man's hand and having it healed was important. It was more important than the fact it was a Sunday or a Sabbath. And so that without a cause, without a cause, that means that anyone who's angry with someone without a reason, see, without a reason, is in danger of judgment. Let me ask you a question. Has God ever gotten angry at anybody, including the angels, without a cause, without a reason? I don't know. Not that I know of. Not that I can find. Did God do something to Lucifer to give Lucifer cause to rebel? and to eventually hate God. Did Abel do something to Cain that made Cain murder him? I don't know. Now here's the question for you. This is the question you're to answer. Have you ever been angry with, had negative feelings toward, been irritated by, didn't want to talk to, to, tried to avoid, looked down on, felt better than, been critical of, been judgmental of, someone for no apparent reason or cause. Well, no apparent reason or cause. I answered that. My answer was, yeah, I have. My answer was, yeah, I still do. I still do. And so the truth is we nurture secret bigotries against people who are of certain color of skin, different cultures, political affiliations, economic status, the presence of tattoos, and the style of clothes, the list goes on. We have trouble with people who listen to the wrong music, who eat the wrong foods, who wear their makeup wrong. You should hear my wife when she sees those women on TV with the big eyelashes. Uh, you know? They never did anything to her. I don't like her. Look at her eyelashes. <laughs> You know? So, so, hey, my feeling is, you know, older men with ponytails, I don't get it. I, I just don't get it. What's their problem? Are they trying to be 30 again? You know? Sissy boy. You see? Racism and bigotry, get this, 
Jesus said it. It's hatred without a cause. And it puts you in danger of the judgment. Hatred with no reason. It had its beginning in the heavenlies with Lucifer. The Bible calls Lucifer's sin pride. Pride. And like sin, it got passed down through Adam to us. Pride. King of the hill. Top of the mark. Master and never slave. You know, leader of the pack. Remember that? <laughs> Captain of my own ship. You don't have to do anything for me to hate you. You don't have to give me cause. Just be another color or race. Be a Democrat. <laughs> have a ponytail. Drive a Mercedes. And I hate you. <laughs> you see, if you're anything that affronts my pride, if you're anything that may be a threat to the world and the life I've chosen and designed for myself, no matter if you do nothing, and I perceive that, I hate you. The Spirit these past two weeks <laughs> made it clear to me, folks, brothers, sisters, you know, I'm a racist. And I'm a bigot. A racist and a bigot. I got a problem. I got some things the Spirit needs to work on that God needs to work on. But guess what? I, I, I was reading... And way back when, a couple thousand years ago almost, guess who had the same problem? The Apostle Peter. The Apostle Peter. And God had to show him in a very real way that he was a racist and a bigot. And all of us, to some degree or another, have to be struggling with that. And that is not, that is not how we as children of God are to identify ourselves. <coughs> the early church struggled with racism, bigotry. America, the most sacred, uh, segregated day of the week in America, the most segregated hour in America is 11 o'clock Sunday morning. We all know it. So what are we to do? Pride. The source of racism and bigotry. It's not going to be done away with by passing the laws of legislation. Have you noticed they try to do that? I'm going to pass a law where you have to hire so many of this race and so many of that race. And that's going to do away with all this. You know, I'm going to make it so college with affirmative actions. They have to take so many of this people and so many. And, you know, and, and then racism can also include gender, right? Women have never been discriminated against, have they? All right. I'm glad I didn't give you an apple so you could throw it. <laughs> so, so here's the good news. As a child of God, which I hope we all are, we know because the Spirit tells us, because the Bible tells us, because our teachers tell us, pride in our lives and thus racism and bigotry can be conquered conquered by the Holy Spirit. Wow, it has no power. You know, most of it's embedded in that body that's on the floor in front of you. And by the way, if you're getting cold, feel free to put that whole thing back on. That's fine. <laughs> There's a song, it's an old song, I love it. 
Maybe I'll let the Eula sing it again or by. When I survey the wondrous cross, on which, on which the Prince of Glory died, right? My richest gain I count but lost, and here's the part. And pour contempt on all my pride. You see, loved ones, that's where it starts. You have to hate the pride that's in your life. Because the things you hate, those are the things you want to get rid of, don't you? It's too bad so many of us nurture it instead of starving the hate we feed it. Whoa, how unlike Christ that is. How unlike our Father that is. I'm going to close with this. The child of God, we're not about Black Lives Matter. And we're not about all lives matter. Because we know hell is a very real place, what we're all about is lost souls matter. That's our unity and purpose. Everything we do should be governed to some extent by that. Lost souls matter. Do they matter to you? Do they matter to me? So we're going to close. As always, it's heritage traditions. If you feel an emptiness and a void and a loneliness and a hunger and you're worried about the spirit that's hiding under this thing we call the body, you can change that in an instant. You can do it with a simple prayer. You can do it by simply recognizing your need for a Savior. It's that simple. You can leave here. If you're unsure about your destiny, you can leave here and be absolutely sure. And so with every head bowed, your eyes closed, I'd like to say a prayer. It's, it's what they call the sinner's prayer. If you feel like it, pray it along with me silently. Father, I come to you aware I'm a sinner, a dead spirit, no life, no light, lots of loneliness, lots of longings. Father, I ask that you forgive my sins. I ask that you come in to my life as Lord and Master. That your spirit melt with mine. And that you make me alive with you. With an eternity in heaven. My guarantee. If you prayed that prayer, you can leave here a little differently. And now I'm going to ask Robert. He's going to come up and do our final song. And I hope you all have a glorious week. I hope you view the COVID a little different. I hope you see the racism in your own life and learn to hate it. And I hope above all we learn to love each other and have a heart for the lost. Let's stand and sing our closing song.
send us home with your blessing and your Holy Spirit's empowerment and direction to do your will and to do the good works for which you have set aside for us to do. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Yeah.